Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. This chapter really did feel like the next big topic that we, like, there's college, there's graduation, and then the very next thing that hits you is money and work and how do you get through the day and, and how do you pay for things? Navigating the world and trying to understand the difference between, you know, kind of the new American capitalism and young guys selling, you know, software or an app or game and, you know, making millions as compared to the new minimalist movement, which says, no, give away everything you own, keep one one shirt. And that's real Christianity. Welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast, John Eldridge, with my son Sam here for week two, reading to you some excerpts from our new book, Killing Lions, A Guide Through the Trials That Young Men Face. This week's chapter is about money. Chapter two, Bouncing Checks. I'd like to live as a poor man with lots of money. Pablo Picasso. The errand runner job I took hardly seemed to be what I had been working toward in college. I took it to pay the bills, and because they were the first people to return my emails. Four years of higher education, and I found myself returning cat food. My alma mater didn't offer a Bachelor of Science in that career track, but the job certainly felt like BS. When did wanting to do something worthwhile turn into just wanting the day to be over and done with? Before graduation, we used to go to the beach and talk about swan diving into the unknown. The ground was falling out from under us, but if we were going to be thrust into the black, we figured we might as well go down with a flourish. It took me almost a year before I couldn't take the meaninglessness anymore. Almost a year before I stepped back out into what feels like the wild of job searching. I quit on my birthday as a nice way to celebrate, but most of my peers didn't support the choice. They looked at me like I was crazy for leaving such an easy job that paid the bills and gave me good stories to tell. For many of them, holding out for something we would have dreamed of back in college was naive. Or better still, creating the dream we wanted was almost a fantasy. The life expectancy of dreams sure seems pretty dang short. It all comes down to money. I've got friends who are chasing the American dream, friends who are opting for the new minimalist movement, and friends trying to do both at the same time. Really, I think my generation is infuriating and completely disoriented when it comes to money. On the one hand, we have watched, like no generation before us, self-made millionaires spring up overnight. And I'm not talking about a million dollars. I'm talking hundreds of millions made from selling an app. In 2012, Rovio, the company that created Angry Birds, was worth more than $2.25 billion. Some dits can put her video on YouTube, become a one-hit wonder, and cash in big time by selling advertising. I know a complete knucklehead who developed an app and made $75,000 in the last month, with no end to the profit in sight. And you know what? I can't blame my friends for trying. My job as a rabbit runner, glorified grocery shopper, actually paid ridiculously well, and I was able to buy a Yamaha FZ1. Man, I love that bike. The previous owner had turned it into a bit of a street fighter, taking off the fairing and rewiring it to be the epitome of sleek, painted jet black. Flying through the canyons, I knew what Sam Flynn felt like in Tron Legacy. It sure looked to me like money buys happiness. But then I started dating a girl who was really concerned about money and the needs of the world. She'd rather give everything away to the homeless than buy nice things for herself. She shops at thrift stores before Macklemore had everyone doing it and patches up worn-out clothing long before retiring anything. This is one of those new revolutions I was talking about, the minimalist movement as a rejection of the American excess, telling us to forego all unnecessary possessions and give away all but the bare essentials. A friend was at a conference for millennials recently, and the big-name speaker said if we have two t-shirts, we have one too many. This is capturing the imagination of a lot of young Christians right now. Who's right? Is anybody right? They feel like two extremes. The first makes us believe we can be an overnight success and start toweling with $100 bills. 
I just heard from my friend who developed the app. He's now up to $90,000 this month. The second grinds out the guilt and has us dropping everything we own at the local shelter. A new American dream or a citizen of the world? Both feel like someone ordered Rocky Mountain oysters for me. At least in the second option, I can give them to my neighbor. I hate money, but I like to eat. I want a cell phone so people could get in touch with me. I want to take Susie out on a date. I'd really prefer to sleep indoors. And to do all that, I need money. My friends are selling out for money, or denying money and living like they're back in the 60s. I hate the way it messes everything up. Maybe money really is the root of all evil. I hear you. Money is messy. And down the road, when you start adding a wife and kids into the equation, money gets messy and urgent. But it's also very clarifying. I mean, nothing can sort out your priorities more quickly than money. That's what the scripture was trying to address when it said that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. From 1 Timothy, money itself is not evil. Greed is. Men leveled the rainforest out of greed with no thought for the future or for the ethics of what they were doing. They raped the oceans for the same reason. Sweatshops, child labor, all those injustices that make your generation so righteously pissed, those are the result of greed. The issue is lust, gluttony, excess. That is the root of all evil. Not money, greed. But what about the fact that everything runs on money? I mean, it has become so natural for men and women to work soul-killing jobs until they are worn to the bone, forsaking time with family, never enjoying the world around them, in order to keep the life that everyone else had told them matters. Walt Harrington wrote in The Everlasting Stream, Years ago, I had stood on my yard at dusk, a glass of wine in my hand, and felt a rush of satisfaction for all the things I had acquired. Then I quickly worried about whether those acquisitions might someday be a trap that would force me to work at what I no longer enjoyed just to pay the tab. Money seems like a seduction that lures you into a trap, and then the trap becomes your life prison. We don't hear about Jeffrey, the carpenter who spent his lifetime crafting chairs and tables only to scrape by. We hear about the successful, the powerful, the accomplished. One has a life that might be fulfilling, but is broke and no one knows him. The other looks glamorous and important, but I know I could never become that. You're beginning to see my frustration, I think. That is the world you are ranting against, and rightly so. The world came up with strip malls, strip mines, and strip clubs. The world is governed by injustice and excess. But making money is not necessarily of the world. God said a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. From Proverbs. One of the great joys of making money is having something to share. But you can't share what you don't have. The more you have, the more opportunity you have to do good. Some friends at church really wanted to adopt a child from overseas, but they couldn't afford it. Money can be the means to great redemption if you have it. Let's compare the world and the kingdom of God. Money is one of the dramatic places where the difference between the kingdom and the world shines brightly. The world is driven by what Aristotle called mimetic desire. It works like this. Two little boys are in a room. One picks up a ball and begins to play with it, and suddenly the other boy wants that ball too. You see it every Christmas. There is the one thing everybody has to have. People get trampled on Black Friday because of mimetic desire. People want what other people seem to be enjoying. The entire system is built on envy and endless consumption. The world says money equals happiness, so spend your life chasing money. Jesus stepped into the madness like the one sane man in a building on fire, calmly pointing us to the exit when he said, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food 
and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They don't labor or spin, and yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. From Matthew chapter 6. So then, the minimalists are right. We shouldn't even be thinking about money or having stuff. Well, kind of. When the scripture tells us that if you have two coats, give one to the poor, we need to notice the math. You cannot give someone your extra coat until you first have an extra coat. You can't help the poor if you yourself are poor. And wouldn't you like to do that more than once in your life? So you will need a means of procuring extra coats. If you have the resources, you can do a great good. I think the minimalist movement is one of those examples of a really good desire taken out of context. As G.K. Chesterton warned, When a religious scheme is shattered, as Christianity was shattered at the Reformation, it is not merely the vices that are let loose. The vices are, indeed, let loose, and they wander and do damage. But the virtues are let loose also, and the virtues wander more wildly, and the virtues do more terrible damage. The modern world is full of the old Christian virtues gone mad. The virtues have gone mad because they have been isolated from each other and are wandering alone. I respect the virtue of the minimalists, but like the hippies of the 60s, this is a childish notion of how the world works. What is it, by the way, with your generation's fascination with the 60s? It was a disaster. Just because a movement seems humble or noble doesn't mean it represents the kingdom of God. Communism promised the working man a fair shake, but in the end, it destroyed the economies of every country that tried it, and the people most hurt were the working class. I was driving through a lovely village in Slovakia a few years ago where a friend lives. All around the town square, there were these empty shops. This is where the craftsmen used to work and sell their goods, Bo explained. Lovely goods. But communism destroyed those shops, and the trades, too. No one has the skills to pass on anymore. It is really very sad. My generation thinks capitalism is bad because of all the greed. The Occupy Wall Street movement was spurred on by legitimate outrage. I don't know anyone my age who is not excited and hopeful for the revolution. But now that legislation has passed, it is the prolonged riot that is close to illegal, not the manipulation of funds and flat-out thievery being committed by CEOs and stock managers. No question that greed has corrupted the capitalist system. But that doesn't make the system itself corrupt. Money is like a car. It can take you good places. It can take you bad places. It can open up adventures, and it can do some serious damage. Everything depends on who's driving. People do some pretty stupid things with cars, but that doesn't make cars evil. Capitalism has proven to be the best system on earth for allowing the working class to better their lives. Look at it this way. The poor vote with their feet. Why do we have to have such strict border control with Mexico? It's not U.S. citizens trying to go south. All over the world, the working man knows his best chance to make a better life for himself is in the United States. That is, unless we destroy our own economy. But let's take money off the table for a minute and talk about the fruit of our labor. Money is simply the representative of our labor. We're never going to return to a system of barter and exchange. I cobble a repair on your shoes and swap it for the bread you baked this morning. Nowadays we work, in return we are paid, and we use those wages to care for our needs and hopefully for the needs of others. Money is simply the fruit of our labor, and labor is a very good thing and very important for men to feel like men. When God created man, 
It was to be fruitful. The first thing Adam got was a job. There's deep satisfaction in a hard day's work. No true man wants to feel like he is a freeloader, living off someone else's labor. One of the nastiest jobs I ever had was in the summer of my 18th year. I was working for the county in Oregon, blowing insulation into attics. It was 90 degrees that July, and probably about 120 degrees in those attics. I sweat like a politician hooked up to a polygraph. I sweat like I had never sweat before, which caused the tiny insulation fibers to stick over every square inch of my body. Horrible stuff. But even still, when we finished the day, there was this deep sense of, man, we did it. We pushed through something really hard. We earned this paycheck. This is essential to masculinity, putting your shoulder to the plow, not in meaningless slavery, but as men who are here to be fruitful, who want to be productive. As Paul wrote, We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. From Second Thessalonians. I think I should probably be honest and admit that often it isn't the job that I don't like. For a long time, it was work in general. I didn't get that sense of satisfaction out of work, which I chalked up to the fact that I was working small jobs. But a project last summer brought a little clarity to things. My friend Trevor and I were standing a large outdoor deck. The days were long and hot and dry, and the chemical we were using was nasty. Even with face masks and eye protection, we had to force ourselves to take breaks when the world started spinning and cartoon animals started dancing in circles around us. But at night, when the work was done and we sat around the poker table, we both felt that the cold drink and the camaraderie were richer because of the work we had put in to be there. One of the best feelings I had as a young man was cutting the ties I had to you and mom financially. I mean, I was grateful for your help in college, but I couldn't stand being dependent afterward. There is something innate in me that knows I am meant to handle things on my own. Maybe it's even a primal sense that I should be capable of putting food on the table. Whatever it is, financially standing on my own is a core need for me to feel like a man. Right. So we have left the question of money aside and focused on labor, and we find that honest work and its fruits are very good things. This is crucial in the move from boy to man. Money forces us to grow up. It is a constant dose of reality, and reality is a gift from God. It has this marvelous way of grounding us. Dean Potter is a truly phenomenal rock climber, but now he thinks he can fly. There's the boy again. Psychologists call it magical thinking. Philosophers have taken this so far they doubt reality even exists, and then they back their Subaru into the neighbor's tree, and reality snaps them out of their magical thinking. You need to eat. You need clothes to wear. Reality shows us just what dependent creatures we are. And that's where fear comes in. I know so many men who make choices based on fear. Fear of not having money, so they take the first job they find. Fear of not doing well in a field they dreamed of, so they don't pursue a job. Fear of not finding something better or of not realizing their dream, so they never leave a job that is killing them which reminds me of a conversation he had with Blaine and Luke about fear. Blaine postulated that many people have a fear of swimming and as a result never go near a swimming pool. Likewise, many people in the church will avoid money, pushing it off or taking a more humble path. He felt this wasn't so much an act of strength or godliness, rather it was an act of fear not to engage in the world of money. There is only so much of the pie out there, he went on. If it is going to be spent, I'd like to have a say where that money goes by affirming the systems I support. I'm sure it was much more eloquent than my paraphrase, but oh well. The idea stuck, though. It takes courage to step into the world of money, and by avoiding it, we lose the ability to play a larger role in saying where it should be spent. I received a terrible phone call yesterday afternoon from the mechanic I've been working with to get my VW bug back on the road. He was delivering that old phrase I've heard too many times. Looks like this is going to be a bit more difficult than we thought. Immediately, I'm thinking, how am I going to pay for this? 
but he was right. It needed some serious work. And now the cushion I thought I had in savings wasn't enough to pay for it all. And whoa boy, it felt like the floor was falling out. It was a battle to stay focused on the fact that God would take care of me. I jumped to thinking of ways to take on more work, digging through old birthday cards in the hope that I missed some cash from Grandma. The overwhelming sensation was, I'm sinking and no one is here to hold me up. This is what I meant when I called money a constant dose of reality. It forces us to wrestle with what we truly believe. Are you fundamentally on your own? Is it all up to you? I believe this is the heart behind the biblical idea of tithing. When you get that paycheck at the end of the month, and the first thing you do is take 10% out to help others, you are immediately faced with, do I really trust God to take care of me? That's what Jesus was getting at in the whole lilies of the field thing. What I'm trying to do here, he said, is to get you to relax, not to be so preoccupied with getting so that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. But you both know God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. From Matthew chapter 6. You see, the world says chase money. Money is your security. God says, chase me. I'm your security. When your mom and I married, we didn't have two nickels to rub together. I mean, we didn't have a dime in savings. All our furniture was borrowed or given to us. We ate off a folding card table your Grandma Jane loaned us for 10 years. We shopped at thrift stores. We lived paycheck to paycheck. And those were some of the happiest years of our lives. We had a great group of friends. We loved our church. We had a lot of fun. God took care of us. The big lie is that more money makes you more happy. It's just not true. But if you don't have any money, your life can be miserable. That is also true. Rather than filthy lucre, Scripture looks at money mostly as a blessing from God. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth, and he adds no trouble to it. Proverbs chapter 10. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. Proverbs chapter 22. Here's the shining beauty of the kingdom. There is an if to that promise that all things shall be given unto us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God will provide for you if you are first seeking his kingdom, living for him. Look, either we have God or we don't. Either he is our ally or we are on our own. What you believe about this affects everything else. If you don't have God, and I mean as an intimate ally, right by your side, you've got to do your best to figure out a path for your life. This is, of course, how most men live. The entire world is based upon this assumption. Universities, markets, career fields, economies. I have no counsel to give you here. For I have rejected that view of the world and cannot tell you much of how it works or how to outwit it. I reject the premise that the whole house of cards is built on. There is a God. He is our Father. Changes everything. Now, let me quickly add that when I say believing in God, I'm not referring to a casual acknowledgement of his existence. If you do have God, you must act like it. For he does not lend his help to those who take him casually, just as you don't offer the treasures of your friendship to those who take you casually. You must seek him with all your heart so that you might discover his help, align yourself with where and how he is moving, and take advantage of all he is bringing you. God promised us, but if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him If you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul, Deuteronomy 4. However, there is a condition in that promise. If you seek him with all your heart and soul, most Christians forget that part and then wonder why God doesn't seem to be more present in their lives. Yeah, we really do. A couple of months ago, I got an email from a buddy of mine that said, I don't know how I didn't realize it before today. How could I have been so blind, so numb to my own senses? It seems so obvious to me now. 
How else could I explain what I have experienced here? The smell, the rancid stink that wafts in through the open doors, that they attribute to the ocean, but do I detect the slightest hint of sulfur? The people, miserable souls clinging to their entitlements as if those small perks they are so used to receiving could ever save their souls. They scream and shriek, claw at the air, gnash their teeth, demand fair treatment as if they deserve it more than anyone else. It is my punishment to endure their cries, and it is their sins of gluttony, greed, pride, vanity, and wrath that have brought them here. All I can do is ask myself what heinous sin I have committed in my past to face such a punishment this severe. I don't know how I didn't realize it before today. I work at hell. My reaction upon reading this? I laughed, and without hesitating, a yup popped up in my head. Not that his job is worse than anyone else's, but I understood that he is far from where he wants to be, where he dreams of being, but he needs to pay the bills. So what do I say to my friend? Is this just something to be endured? If we are just working to survive, or, as Calvin's father would say in Calvin and Hobbes, if we are building character, what happens to our dreams? Obviously, we've been told to chase our dreams. Over and over again, every high school and college graduation speech challenged us to reach for the stars, as though they had just stumbled upon an original metaphor. But all the while, we weren't given much on becoming the people who could handle the dream when we got there. Probably because Disney didn't think it had the right musical ring to it. What I want to say to your friend is, for now, just for now, you have a future. You have a father who loves you. But yes, you are in the forge. Let it strengthen you. Hang in there. God is up to something in these days. Look for where he is shaping you. It will be worth it. As a warrior, you'll have to fight to hang on to your dreams. As a young man, you also have to learn the discipline not to lose heart through really hard stuff. I'm a successful author now, but in my early 20s, I went through some pretty tough times. God is shaping us to become men who can handle life. Money actually destroys a lot of men. Money in the hands of people who are still children inside does enormous damage. So does power or fame and influence. Mankind has an allergy to God. We find it uncomfortable to seek him, to align our desires and our way of doing things with his desires and his way of doing things. Agnosticism comes so naturally to us to forget him, to accept the evidence that life is pretty much up to us. We are half-hearted creatures when it comes to God and his way of doing things. So he allows trial confusion and distress in hope that it will compel us to seek him. And as we do, things in us are being addressed. Our unbelief, our independence and self-reliance, our fear, our pride. Better sooner than later to address these, by the way. They are the things that destroy a man's life somewhere down the road. The Christian is something of an amphibian. We live in two worlds. This world of men and commerce, of our times and culture, and we also live in the kingdom of God. Too many Christians accept a vague notion that God is somehow at work in this world, but for the most part, they take the world of men as the truer world and operate upon the rules and assumptions of that world. You really must resolve this first. Do I live in a parallel universe? Is there a kingdom of God which I am a member of? and can participate in? Do I have his help? If you answer yes, then you must proceed like it. Seek it. Learn to live within it. Otherwise, you're left with, here is the world. It is unstable, unfair, and unpredictable. Find a way to make life work, which proves mighty hard for most men, but nearly impossible for the believer because God is jealous over you and will not lend help to your efforts to live life at even a casual distance from him. Notice how your heart responds to some of the basic disciplines of money. Stay out of debt. Live within your means. If you don't have enough money to buy that latte every day, don't buy it. It is the boy who cannot restrain himself and puts the big screen TV on a credit card and then pays twice its worth in interest. You don't want to become someone else's slave, and debt makes you a slave. Yeah, it really does. 
I have a friend who maxes out every credit card he gets just to buy clothes and go out to fancy dinners. We call it the rich man, poor man syndrome. Like when the folks making minimum wage buy spinner tires for their minivan instead of backpacks for their kids. I don't want to be a slave. The boy in me may not like waiting for things, but the man in me knows I'd much rather live free from debt and this awful dichotomy of the rat race and the minimalists. And the most beautiful thing of all is this. If we will reject the whole mimetic nightmare of the world, if we will align ourselves to God's way of doing things, money won't rule our lives, nor will fear. Money won't even be what we're thinking about. We'll be chasing higher things. And then our finances will become one of the main opportunities where we get to see God come through. And he loves to come through. What immediately just came to me was that reaction of, oh, like, Ugh. To reorient, to think that you would be okay financially, yeah. that financial success or failure, right. all of the fear involved there, that that could be alleviated, that God would take care of you. I mean, that's what I've experienced since we wrote this, that over the past year and a half, beginning to trust God more and more, it alleviates so much strain. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. We so hope you are enjoying hearing some of the content of Killing Lions, our new book, which releases this week. It's out here the week of September 8th. And so tell the young men in your life or better pick up a couple copies and give it to the young men in your life and to the fathers and mothers that are raising young men. My goodness, you're going to love this book. Thanks for listening in on the Ransom Tart Podcast. I'm John Eldridge with my son, Sam. Eldridge.